Oh, hi everyone. My name is Phoebe Kim, um, VCDX288. Uh, with me, I have Chris. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, Chris Muchler, uh, VCDX257. And, uh, excited to do this with Phoebe this morning. You sound super excited, Chris. Oh no, I am. I am. <laughs> no, we haven't I'm done just this kidding. together in a while. It's been like a year, so it's actually good. I think so. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so awesome. So we're here to answer any of your questions. Um, Carl, um, the program uh, director, also is here as well. So if you guys have any questions about the program with any administrative or operational questions, he could be happy to answer for you as well. So, um, to, so traditionally, VCDX workshops used to be like three to four hours long. Um, and it include, included, you know, everything from the process, the program, the process, everything about defense tips, and we did like an example design scenario and all of that. Um, but of course, with uh, Zoom fatigue and COVID and all of this being virtual, we decided to break this up into several sessions um, that are a bit a lot shorter and reserve more time at the end for questions um, as Chris and I both are panelists. Um, it's an exclusive opportunity essentially for you to ask questions um, to us. So this session will be an hour and a half um, where the first 45 minutes will be about the program and the process, which is the focus today. And then the rest of the time for you guys to ask any questions that might arise. So let's get started. All right, so what is the VCDX certification? So, sorry, did you have a question? I think you're okay, I think they were just joining. Oh, okay. Oh, by the way, um, if you guys have questions, just come off mute and ask, or if you'd like, you could also ask a question on chat and we'd be happy to answer those. Yep, I'm monitoring um, the chat window. So if you have a question there, just post it. Perfect. All right, so VC, VCDX, the VMware Certified Design Expert Certification is the highest tier of a VMware technical certification that you can achieve. So essentially this is what um, you know, our CEO calls the PhD of VMware, right? Um, so it focuses mainly on architectural design skills. So this is beyond you know, where you would start with a VMware certified professional, your VCP, and then your VMware certified advanced professional, your VCAP, which when you do both in one track, you get the VMware certified implementation expert or VCIX certification. So once you get to the VCIX level, that's essentially when you can actually apply and submit your uh, application for a VCDX defense. So there are four different tracks for VCDX at the moment. There's the data center virtualization or DCV for short, which is vSphere based. There's the desktop, um, which is DTM, desktop and mobility, and it's horizon based, or it can also be workspace one design. So essentially anywhere workspace goes into that desktop or DTM track. There's the cloud management and automation or CMA. This one, it could be a design based on vCloud Director or vRealize Automation. Either of them is fine. And the last but not least of the four tracks is Network Virtualization or NV. At the moment, I think we still accept NSXV designs, if I'm correct, Carl or Chris. I don't know if you guys can confirm. At the moment, yes, but yeah, but no. not for much longer, I don't think. No. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I would recommend definitely going with NSXT design, right? As NSXV essentially is, um, you know, end of end of life, end of support, all of that fun stuff. So, but <laughs> my understanding too, right, Phoebe, the VCAPs for NV have changed to NSXT at this point as well. They both yes. have, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that's correct. And I guess for cloud management one too, um, I think it's now VRA eight for all of those exams. So uh, you can still submit a vCloud director uh, design, but you know, with all of the track now being VRA focused, um, I, I'm, I'm seeing more VRA submissions lately than VCD ones. Um, but yeah, so why should you pursue a VCDX? Um, for one, it as an architect, it validates your capability and your expertise 
um, on VMware technologies overall. Another is that it, it would increase your value to the customers and employers, um, you know, having that highest certification in VMware, right? And it validates essentially your employer's expertise in that field as well. And if you are looking for a new job for whatever reason, it does help you and give you that competitive advantage in the marketplace um, to stand out from, from the crowd. And actually, if you're looking for another job, for me, it's been more helpful that you know people in the community and they actually would recommend you or, you know, give you an interview or that kind of first foot in the door idea. Um, so for me, the community actually has been the biggest benefit to having a VCDX and getting to know, you know, basically like one of the top and smartest people in the industry. So um, for me, the community has been big. And of course you get the community recognition as well um, as a VCDX. Chris, anything else you'd like to add? Um, Anything no, you found again, beneficial? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is you have to want it for yourself. And I think we'll talk a little bit about that later. But, you know, a lot of us in the industry, we are competitive, we are driven. And this is, you know, one of those goals that is both while it's attainable, it's still difficult enough that it will indeed set you apart um, from your peers in the industry. Yeah. Perfect. An additional benefit is that if you do achieve your VCDX, then you automatically get accepted to the V expert program as well. If you are not already a V expert, um, so all the benefits that essentially come as a V expert. So, for example, you know, like licenses to different products um, or just swags overall that you get as a V expert. If those things are important to you, um, this is one of the other benefits that come with being a VCDX. So in terms of the program structure, um, I've, I guess I've touched on this a little bit in the beginning when I talked about the steps you go through in order before you can submit your application um, for VCDX Defense. So there is a VMware certified uh, associate exam if that's where you would like to start. But I think most people do start at the certified professional level, at the VCP level for whichever track that you are interested in. Um, pursuing and growing. So once you get a VCP, you would have two different VCAP exams. One is focused on the design aspect of the product. And then two, the second exam is focused on the deployment. So making sure that like it literally gives you a lab environment and you need to go in and be able to um, set things up, you know, troubleshoot, figure things out um, and actually implement the, the solution. So there are two parts for the VCAP, which gives you that um, VCIX, which is a prerequisite to you know, your VCDX. So that's essentially um, similar throughout all of the different four tracks that we have. I believe for network virtualization, um, VCPNV is still waived for CCIEs and you could start at the VCAP level. Um, I don't know, Carl, if that's still the case. Yeah, it's it's the it actually waives the training requirement for you to become a VCP. So you do have to pass the VCP exam still, but it does waive some of the requirements to get there. Oh, OK, perfect. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for the confusion there. But thank ah, you for no clarification. <laughs> awesome. So how can you achieve your multiple VCDXs? So um, I, I like this slide just because like I get this question a lot. Uh, I don't know about you, Chris, but everyone's like, oh, I'm going to do like three or four, like from the get go. <laughs> At least I got that recently a lot. Um, so you can start uh, with the DCV design as a foundation for your um, solution and then essentially bolt on different products um, onto your you know, base data center design in order to meet the requirements for the different tracks, right? So if you focus on DCV, obviously your solution will be vSphere based. It would have all the you know, details that you would need from a physical um, hardware um, perspective as well for compute storage and network. So you would have all of that. Um, and then let's say you wanted to now pursue an NV track um, in VCDX, you could add to the requirements and the design to add NSXT into the mix. Um, which would 
help you achieve the requirements for the NV track, which then you could potentially put on a VRA or VC on top of that. Likely it would be VRA um, if you're trying to bolt on things this way and, and then add that to fulfill the requirements for CMA. And then in the end, if you'd like, also add on the EUC portion of that and then you know go for the DTM as a fourth uh, VCDX. So, but of course you don't have to do it in that sequence, right? Um, I would definitely recommend that your first VCDX is in a track that you are most comfortable with and you have more most experience in. So, um, because doing the VCDX defense is hard enough, it's already stressful. So if you're trying to do it in an area that you're not as experienced in, it just adds to that stress, I think. And so for me, for example, um, I started with an NV because I was an, I come from NSX background. So that's the area I'm most comfortable with. And I already had a VCIX for NV and honestly, like nothing else but VCPs for the other tracks. So I started my design with network virtualization in NSX uh, v at the time, but with that, um, like at least my solution, it was a vSphere based design anyway. So that's what, so naturally I did a data center one right after that without having to change the solution much. I lit I essentially just added more details to my document about like the physical compute storage network layers and the vSphere side of things um, and kind of fulfill the requirements for DCV that way. Um, for the CMA, I bolted on VRA cloud on top of what I already had submitted for DCB and NV. So you don't, there's no right or wrong answer as to how you can approach multiple VCDXs, whatever works for you. But again, my recommendation is go with the track that you are most comfortable in, you have the most experience and knowledge, um, and that will help you at least in the, in the first VCDX, which is the most stressful one. So. Anything else, Chris, you'd like to add? No, just, just like what you said, Phoebe, right? Pick the one that you're most comfortable with, especially if you feel like you do want to do more than one at some point. Um, I think the two most common still are DCV and NV. I think those are kind of the two most popular tracks. So certainly just pick the thing that you're most, you're most comfortable with because it is going to be stressful. Yeah. And I guess the point of the other slide too was that uh, one of the questions I get is, do you need a completely new design for each VCDX? And that's not the case, right? You can build onto your design as long as the products are not out of support and you know end of life and all of that. Um, so a good example is if you did a V design three years ago and then get got your VCDX and like two years later, you want to build like put VRA on top of that, you know, that, that wouldn't ex exactly work out. So, um, so yeah, essentially to achieve your VCDX, the simple workflow is you could get any of one of the VCDX, uh, sorry, VCDX in one of the tracks, you submit a design for that track and then um, go through your defense for pass or fail. For subsequent VCDXs, so second, third, or fourth, um, those you have to still submit the design. And then from there, you have a remote defense, which is only 60 minutes for your defense. And then that would be a pass or fail on your subsequent uh, VCDXs. So for, let's see, for the road to your VCDX. So starting off, I think the first thing you should do is yes, attending one of the workshops is great or any of the mentoring series that we have for VCDX. Um, but the first and most important thing to me that I repeat probably thousands of times in any of these workshops is to read the blueprint for the VCDX track that you're going for. So each of the VCDX for each track has its own blueprint, which outlines all the components that you need to include in your documents and that you should show expertise in um, during the defense and your design scenario. So blueprint, blueprint is essentially your guide to success. Print it out, post it on the wall, whatever you need to do, just keep referring to it throughout the entire process so you don't like lose sight of the goal, right? And, and the requirements that you need to meet in order to get these certifications. So the blueprint to me is the most important. 
um, that you review first thing. Now, once you review the blueprint, that should help you in terms of what you need in your document um, to include about your solution, right? So here it says like 90 to 150 hours to um, create uh, all the documents to submit for your VCDX. Um, obviously, it depends on you. It depends on what, how long maybe it takes for you to do the project or write the documents and whatnot. Um, I think it definitely took me like, yeah, like hundred, at least hundred hours, if not more, <laughs> to do my documents. Um, but yeah, so it just it just depends. Now you submit the application, you'll hear back in about a month or like a six week, four to six weeks, whether the application is accepted um, and you get invited to the VCDX defense. Now here, the next step is to prepare for that VCDX defense um, and the panel. We always recommend as soon as you submit your application, just pretend that it will get accepted and just start preparing and doing mock defenses and all of that. Because once you once you hear the acceptance, your defense is scheduled within about two to three weeks after that. So you don't have a lot of time in between your acceptance letter and then your actual defense being scheduled. So as soon as you submit your application, you could take like a weekend or a week break, right? But after that, just <laughs> start preparing and doing mocks and all of that um, to prepare for your VCDX defense. Um, you would have the defense then, and then hopefully um, it's a one-time deal and you pass, but that's pretty uncommon. Um, I don't know about you, Chris, actually, but uh, I took it at least twice for the first one. Yeah, um, yeah so it, I mean, there are people who pass the first time. Don't, be, don't think that it's impossible. Um, it really just depends on your... A lot of it comes down to how comfortable you are um, defending your design decisions. I, I think we, we, were at, we really touched on it, but I mean, the, the most important thing to remember as we go as you go through the defense itself, it's not about being right. It's about being able to defend the decisions that you make within your design. There are many different ways to do architecture, especially um, from an SDDC perspective, based off of requirements and so forth. So. It's, it's, being, it's about being prepared. It's about being comfortable in front of others, being able to articulate um, your design decisions and the reasons behind them. So that's where, you know, that second box, the prepare part, that 90 to 150 hours, it's really critical that you're comfortable with, with your design um, and what you're going to submit, so. Yeah, cool. So, Chris, if you don't mind, I'll pass it to you to continue the rest of the section. Yeah, sure. So there's a lot of different things that drive people um, towards the VCDX certification. Um, and there's a lot of different character traits that people will have. I think you can see on the screen here, there are some that are probably the most common amongst all of those um, people who have earned their certification. Um, the community is very open. Um, and so you have an opportunity um, through Twitter and blogs and everything to get to know many of us. Um, almost all of us, I would say the vast majority of the 295 people who currently have their certification are active um, in the community and willing to talk to other people who are interested in it. But I think some of the things that really always stand out um, is really around that self-motivated self -motivated individual, a driven individual. Um, the other one that really always sticks out is the continuous learner, um, right? Typically, we are the individuals, like you can see, I will plug, I'll plug Phoebe Fear for a minute, okay? Because she was on my team a few years ago when she got her first one, um, and I got to know her pretty well. She's the first female to earn all three, the triple VCDX. She's an extreme example of a continuous learner. She's always pushing herself. And many of us are like that, whether it's VMware certifications, whether it's other industry certifications, you know, Red Hat, Kubernetes, TOGAF, whatever it might be, we are always continuous learners. Many of us are out there always interested in the bleeding edge. Um, and we're all self-motivated, right? We don't have to have somebody else externally motivate us um, to be able to, to go down these paths. These are just things that are inherent in our characters. Now, if you're not self-motivated, can you do this? Absolutely. Will it be more difficult? 
I would say yes, right? I, my opinion is that if you're not self-motivated, it's yes. As you looked at the previous slide there, um, when you start to think about spending 100 or 200 hours on something, you really have to be self-motivated. You've really got to want it. Um, so I think the other thing, you know, is, you know, we are individuals who are always looking for what's next. What, what's the next thing that I should be, that's on the horizon that I want to be, you know, engaged with, that I want to be learning about, um, staying ahead of what the industry trends are and so forth, and always kind of uh, proving ourselves as, as we go through it. So if you want to go to the next slide, Phoebe. So when we talk about, you know, all of those character traits and you start to think about how can you start this process? Um, if you've heard of the SMART goal method, it's been around for probably 25 years now, if not a little bit longer. Um, I'll date myself. I, I started using the SMART method in the early 2000s at the beginning of my career. Um, it's a great way to kind of set goals. Um, everybody sets goals differently. Everybody approaches goal setting differently, and that's fine. This is just one suggestion. So when you look at SMART, it stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, and as we break this out, this is really what you can do um, as you start to look at your VCDX, the process that it's going to be, that it's going to take. Um, I'm not sure there might be some of you who have not yet earned your VCAPs yet, right? But you're already starting to think down the line what comes after, that's great. Um, being able to set some specific goals around what you want to accomplish, make sure they're measurable. I think, Phoebe, if you go to the next slide, it'll, we'll, we're gonna focus on just a couple of them. The first one being specific, right? So. Why do you want to get your VCDX, right? This is, this I think is the most important one. Why do you want it? Do you want it because there's a promotion at the end of the road for you, you know, within your group, it, whether it be a new title, whether it be financial motivation, whatever it might be, but why do you want it? Do you want it for the recognition? Whatever it might be, um, you just have to have that answer. The other thing is, um, you know, obviously which track do you want to do? We've kind of talked about that a little bit already. Um, I think number three is really, really important though. Who are you going to ask for help as you go down this, right? We all have mentors at various points in our career, I think. We all have individuals, coworkers who we trust their opinion. If you know somebody who already has their VCDX, whether you work with them on a day-to-day -day basis or it's just somebody you know within your, your company, those are good people to reach out and to ask them to, hey, have a conversation with, can we have a conversation around what you had to do to earn your VCDX? So, but be specific. The other thing too is be open and honest with yourself about where you are on this journey so that you can understand where you need to spend time um, improving your skill set, improving your, um, like I said, your how comfortable you are in front of others. Um, so if you want to go, I think the next one is yep, achievable. So that's kind of what we're talking about, right? Be honest with yourself about your expertise and your state of mind. Um, I think the key differentiator between the VCDX certification and the VCAP and the VCP tests, VCAP and VCP is really going to focus, you know, 99% of it is all technical. Can you answer a multiple choice question? You know, can you draw out a design? Whatever it might be, very technical. Does this product work like this? What what radio button do you have to switch to turn on DRS, that sort of thing. Um, when you look at the VCDX certification, while it is still a technical certification and about, I would say probably 75 or 80% of what we score you against is technical. The other 20-ish percent of the certification is soft skills. How comfortable are you in front of a customer? Can you articulate, and this is what I was talking about a few minutes ago, can you articulate why you made the decisions that you make? Um, and so be honest with yourself. If you're not great at public speaking, it comes across. And so maybe one of the things that you need to spend time on while you're on this journey is looking for opportunities to, to improve your public speaking skills, for example. You know, uh, in the United States, there's a group um, called Toastmasters, right, in, in most cities out there where it just focuses on helping professionals get better at public speaking. Um, if your job isn't one where you're in front of a customer asking them questions around requirements and risk and business needs and that sort of thing, you know, that's part of the design scenario that we're going to put you through during the VCDX certification panel. So 
learning how to be able to ask those kinds of questions, ask leading questions, right? Be able to understand the information that a customer is giving you and then take that information and apply it into a design. Again, not so much technical, but certainly, you know, kind of that soft skill area. So be honest with yourself where you are um, because it's going to be important for you. Um, and it's, you know, and yeah, so yeah, that's just it. And then this is the other one that, and this is why we focus this one time bound. Um, so the VCDX calendar is out on the website. Um, if you're not aware, you can go to vcdx.vmware.com. Um, right at the top there is a calendar. Um, all of the dates for the upcoming year are published ahead of time. So you can see when the submission deadlines are. The way that I did this for myself, and I think Phoebe, you might have done it similarly, which is pick the date that you're going to submit and then work backwards from it, right? What, what are the key milestones that you're going to have to complete? You know, when are you going to have your design done? When are you going to have your implementation guide done? When are you going to have your project plan completed by, right? And work against those dates, you know, against one of the submission deadline dates so that you can do it. The, uh, that's going to be one of the, the critical things for you. So look at the calendar, pick a date that works for you. And if it's like your VCAPs, if you're like, okay, when am I going to take my VCAPs? Set a date, right? And then work backwards. What do you have to do? to be able to pass that, whatever the VCAP test that you might still need to do um, to finish it off. So um, set intervals. Um, if you have a mentor, um, ask your mentor to hold you accountable. Say, hey, these are the dates that I've, that I've set for myself. Help me make sure that I'm, you know, set check-in points with them so that you can say, hey, yes, I'm reporting back. I've gotten this far um, so to be able to help your, uh, hold yourself accountable. So Phoebe, anything yeah. you wanna add kind of on those, those three? Oh, no, I think you co covered everything. Just if you haven't checked the calendar before, the defenses are held um, quarterly. So we have one coming up, I believe, next week. Um, so, if, for week example, after. if you want, yeah. oh, it's the week after, sorry, it's the week after. So if it's like end of, it's towards end of March. So if you want it, and you kind of have to work backwards, like Chris said. So if you want to defend, let's say in June, I believe the application for those are due like in April, I would say, you know, like it's about two months or so before. So that's why, you know, definitely look at a calendar, pick a date, at least the defense date you'd like to shoot towards and then look at when the applications are due for those. So it's not like, like VCAP, I'm pretty sure like, oh, I can schedule one next week. It's kind of, it's not like that for this one as much. You, you would have to plan at least a quarter out. Yeah, that's it. So <laughs> if, so, and Doug, you kind of asked a, little, a question a little bit before about this. Um, if you have, I don't know how many of you on the phone call are consultants. Um, typically, this is a problem, I would say, for mostly for consultants, um, less for like enterprise architects at a single company. But if you have multiple designs that you can choose from, um, how do you pick one, right? And the, the way that I talk about this is, Pick the one that's most interesting, right? If it has an interesting use case, maybe you're designing something for the edge or for the manufacturing space, whatever it might be. Pick something that's interesting. Um, pick something that you're going to be excited about to talk about for about two hours on the day of the defense. But more importantly, pick something that you're going to be interested in working on for 100 plus hours as you put together all of that information. Um, again, things that will set you apart to the panelists if it's a unique um, design, you know, like I said, edge, OT, you know, manufacturing, medical space, something like that. It doesn't have to be, okay, so don't, don't misinterpret. If you can have a vanilla design, one of my very best friends in the world, Simon, his design was probably one of the most boring you could have picked for DTM like a decade ago when he got his, but so that, that doesn't, doesn't preclude you, but pick something that's going to be, maybe it's innovative, you know, is it doing something with Tanzu or Kubernetes in, in that space? You know, is it have an odd use case? Did you have strange requirements? Maybe there was something unique about it around BCDR or high availability, whatever it might have been. But just pick something that you're going to want to, one, spend 100 hours or more, you know, writing about and working on and then still be excited to talk about it for two hours um, during your defense. Um, so that, that's kind of the big thing. The other thing too is, and this is, I think, critical, Phoebe talked about it, the blueprint should become your best friend during this process. Um, I tell everyone, I kept a, a 
paper copy of the blueprint on my desk, both at home and at work while I was doing this. Um, and that was so that I could actually look at, look at the blueprint and judge where I was at in my design. Did I have requirements that covered everything in the blueprint? Um, had I identified risks in that thing? And so if you have multiple designs, maybe what makes a decision for you is you grade each one against the blueprint and you've got one that's much further along than the other and would then hypothetically be less work to work on. So, um, yeah, okay. actually, um, a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah a, oh, did you see the question? Cause I, I would love to answer that in person <laughs> instead of typing that out. One. Yeah. You can, you can, you can first start. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I think, I, I think we'll talk about this little Carson. That's a great question. Um, so many of you are aware, I don't know if we still have the slide Phoebe or not in the deck, but there is you know, two things. There's the VMware validated designs, which are out there. Oh, you do. Yeah. The VMware validated designs and the, and the VCF product in and of itself. Um, so you can't just download the VVD, put your name on it, change a couple names and turn it in. Okay. That's not allowed. Um, it is a reference architecture. The thing that I will stress about it is it is a reference architecture. It's a great example for formatting. So if you've never written a document like this before, and you're just like, the formatting alone can be daunting. Um, so you can use it. It's a great example of how to format things. It's a great example for how to highlight what your design decisions are and so forth. But you can't just download it, zip it up and send it our way, right? That won't, won't get accepted. And you'd be doing yourself a disservice, to be honest, because I don't think you'd be able to defend it the way you would think. Uh, Phoebe, did you want to add something there? No, you got it. I think we get this question a lot. And lately, we've been getting more questions about this because for example, oh, what if I use like VMC on AWS or what if I use VRA Cloud, which I did. Um, and in that sense, you could you could show your expertise in those areas in different manner. So you can you can, but it it is hard. <laughs> um, and like Chris said, you you're kind of doing a disservice to yourself um, because in that sense, you're not also learning as much as you can while going through the process either. Right, so by using uh, something like VCF instead of let's say you designing the whole stack, right? And then you having to understand what that means um, for your design and all of that. So, so yeah, a great question, love it. Yeah, the other thing I would add, and you can see it in the blue thing. So if there is a design decision that you looked at the VVD and you're like, hey, for my specific requirements, this design decision makes sense and I want to, I want to leverage it that's acceptable so long as you reference it. Just like when we were writing research papers in high school and in college, if you cite the source, that's acceptable. To Phoebe's point, you still need to be able to defend it though. You can't, the, if we ask you, why did you decide that decision? You can't come back and just say, well, the VVD did it. That's, that's like a failing answer, okay? You can say, I saw it in the VVD and here's why it makes sense for my use case for my design. Again, this is really all about you being able to articulate and defend the decisions you made. Yeah, and Doug is exactly right there in the chat. The point is that you have to be able to defend your decisions. So hopefully that helps. Again, and that, that citing thing goes for anything. If you've read something on Cormac's blog or um, really, you know, William's blog, if you find something on one of their blogs, you're like, hey, they, they recommended this for this thing and this met my requirements, just document it, just say, hey, this was on the blog, this met my requirements and this is why it met my requirements. And so I went with it and that's, that's totally good. Um, this is a great one, I love this slide, complexity and privacy. So it's not about the number of pages that you turn in. I've seen people pass with um, design documentation that's 60 pages long. I've seen people pass with design documentation that's 200 pages long. Um, it's really around how much is required for your requirements. How, how many design decisions you have to make is gonna be based off of the number of requirements and how, how um, diligent you were in gathering those things. And as long as it lines up with the blueprint and you've covered all of the major categories in the blueprint, you might be able to accomplish that in 60 pages, 80 pages, whatever it might be. Um, the main thing, and it's there at the bottom there, focus on the business requirements. 
right? Show us your design decisions against all of them. Um, from a privacy perspective, um, again, we don't ever share it outside. Um, Carl's on the phone. I, I'll say generally speaking, there's probably maybe five people, six people who actually read your design. It gets read during the pre-phase by a couple different people and scored. And then if you're invited to defend it, then there's three panelists who are going to read it um, for your defense. Um, depending on whether or not we have uh, panelists in training um, shadowing it, they'll read it as well. Um, but again, it's very few. If you do have um, questions around uh, the privacy side of it and who might, um, who might read it, first thing, feel free to scrub company names. You can put Acme Inc. in there for your customer. And that's not going to have any material influence on your score. Um, things like public IP addresses, you know, you can swap those out. I just look to see that, you know, he said he needed a slash 24. Did he assign a slash 24 or did she assign a slash 24 for it? I don't look at, oh, that's in the 10 space or the 172 space. I don't, that, that level of detail <laughs> is not something you're scored against. So if you feel like, hey, I just want to scrub a lot of that out, feel free to do so. Domain names, again, you can scrub those whatever it might be. But if you do have questions around something uh, sensitive, um, go ahead and you can send an email to, uh, I think it's still vcdx at vmware.com um, if you have a concern. So did I miss anything, Phoebe, around that? No. I think the other thing too, I, I, I alluded to this moment, complexity. The design itself doesn't have to be super complex, right? Like I ascribe to the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. Okay, if it takes one thing or five things, whatever it takes to just get you through the design and to satisfy all the requirements, don't try to make it overly complex. The other thing is don't throw every piece of VMware software into your design because you think it'll help you. Again, put it in there because there's a valid business reason for it or requirement behind it. So, yeah. No, for sure. I think complexity, um, the, the size of the environment, I think people ask about a lot too. Like, do I, does this have to be a big environment for some enterprise customer? The answer is no, the environment size essentially doesn't matter because again, as Chris has mentioned it many times, it depends on the requirements. And all we want to know is that as an architect, did you design a solution that you know, satisfied all the requirements and what kind of design decision did you make? to make sure the requirements are met. Um, and if you've identified any risks, how have you mitigated them and this and such. So it's not about that. Um, actually, like before I became a panelist, I like semi mentored a, um, a colleague of mine, like semi just cause like we were helping each other out. But um, one of the things like he was trying to decide, hey, like what is my project gonna be? You know, what should I include in this? And he had like really great ideas, but he also made it, overly complex. So I told him like, take this out and take that out and try, try to make your story also easier to tell, right? You only have 75 minutes in a defense to go through all of everything that the blueprint asks you to cover. Yes, the panelists will have read your design beforehand, but it is easier for you to tell the story of your client and what they needed and why you've done this for these sort of whatever requirements. It is a lot easier for you as well um, to defend if it is not so overly complex. So definitely go with Chris's, you know, KISS method and yeah. you know, keep it simple. <laughs> cool. The right. last S is not maybe not as politically correct anymore. <laughs> oh, if you say KISS, technically you don't have to have the next S, right? <laughs> So um, it's okay. Um, so yeah, so I think that kind of ends the program and process part of um, the main part of this session. Now, I guess we just wanted to share a couple of next step and additional resources to get you started. So uh, Chris mentioned earlier, the first thing, having a mentor is always great, right? Um, and there are lots of VCDXs out there who you know help others um, to achieve theirs. So. There is a form that you can uh, request a mentor through, and there are some rules of engagement. So for example, we used to get a lot of questions as mentors like, oh, is this correct? Um, for example, like you, you put a design out and like, is this correct? I'm like, 
Uh, that's technically not uh, my a mentor's responsibility to answer that. Also, I think Chris, you did mention this earlier too, or Doug did, where there's no right or wrong answer sometimes when it comes to architecture, right? There are just a lot of different ways to do something. And it's your job to decide on one that fits the customer and their requirements and then defend it. Just explain why you've done that. It's the, it's the key of doing this VCDX. Um, so yeah, definitely don't ask your mentors if something is correct. Um, and they're not going to be the one obviously building the design for you. That's, uh, that's definitely not the case, um, not the point of doing the <laughs> certification. And please don't ask them to share their design as well or share their, um, you know, what happened uh, in their defense and whatnot first. If they done it a long time ago, they won't remember, but it's a confidential part of a defense as well, where, you know, we ask you not to share everything that happened and such. Um, and sharing the design, yeah, you won't find anyone's design ever like posted online. Like it's not something you could just Google. Um, and it is not, is not it, what do you say? Like, it's not really fair for them, I guess, to give you that and share their design as well. Um, it's just a process that you, I think it's a learning process that you go through. And I think it's valuable for you to, you know, write your own uh, document anyway. If you need help in terms of how to get started, like, content, uh, table of contents or something, I've actually pointed people to VBD and say, hey, this gives you a good idea of what your document can, how your document can be organized. And VBDs also have those design justification boxes um, or design decision tables that you can also kind of take that idea to um, and put that in your uh, document. So, that yeah. and the and study I always, sessions. I, always, I should oh, have it on my desk already. I will. I think we plug this book here in a minute. But this is the oh, IT yeah. foundation in the art of our infrastructure design. It was written by VCDX one twenty three and seventy nine. Mark Erzud or John Erzud and Mark Gabriel Zelski. Always mispronounce his last name. Apologize. Mark hears this later, but they're amazing. One of the reasons that this is so great is in the back of it. It has some. It has some recommendations on how to format your paperwork. It also has a way, you know, suggestions on how to highlight your design decisions and the, and the critical factors of them and so forth. Um, I've gone through, I think, three paperback copies of this thing. It's, it's next to my desk all of the time. Um, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to all read it as you do this. It's a great, great book. Um, I make no money from that plug but i mean it's one of those resources it helped me personally i failed my first defense this book came out i talked to john i read through it um and it, it drastically improved my skill set as an architect um and then uh yeah I'll, I'll post it here in the i'll post a link to it on amazon here in just a moment here brent in the chat but uh but yeah so it's a great thing there are people out there who've like phoebe said publish their table of contents i'm one of them me giving you my table of contents doesn't do you any good other than to just see how I structured my information, right, for my BCD. Um, again, the blueprint kind of helps you there too to make sure that you cover all the key areas. And then, like we said, the VVD is a great, uh, a great, a great reference material <laughs> for how to uh, do all of that kind of documentation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I actually, so when I was starting out my VCDX journey, uh, Joe sent me a recording of a VCDX workshop that you did actually, Chris. And like, <laughs> and so I did get that book right after listening to your workshop and read, that was one of the first thing I did is read the blueprint and read this book. And it did help me a lot. So definitely were highly recommended. And yeah, no, Chris, you probably haven't been getting paid for that for the last like five, six years <laughs> you've been doing these workshops. I love this book. I mean, I, yeah, no, I, it's great. <laughs> um, and if you've ever gotten a chance to meet uh, John or Mark, they're great. Uh, they're great people. There's a link for it. Um, again, it all, it sells out every year at BM. Oh, so they, they always have copies or at least, well, I guess we haven't been in person at VM world the last two years, but when we were in person at VM world and you would go to the bookstore, um, it would always sell. There's a bunch of other books in this 
um, just generally speaking, as we talk about just becoming better architects, there's other books in this series. There's one that's focused on risk, um, which is really great. Um, there's another one that's, uh, oh, I can't remember her name. It's going to aggravate me. But there's another one about like the journey to becoming a VCDX that was written by one of the first women VCDXs. Uh, I want to say it was Rebecca, but that might not be it. Um, but again, just a great series if you're looking for, for things to help make you better architects, whether you're going to get the certification or not. So um, yeah. you want me to talk about this one? This is a good one too, everybody. I mean, yeah. you talked about mentors. You know, the other part about the community that's really great is that there are people out there who will help you, okay, that with mock defenses, with study sessions. Again, these are things that your mentor can help you with. These are things that the community can help you with. Um, again, if you know people who have their VCDX and you ask them questions, you know, the vast majority of us more than willing to, to help individuals and so forth. Um, as panelists, Phoebe and I are kind of limited in what we're allowed to do. We can do this. I can, we can answer generic questions. We'll never reveal anything that's on the rubric or the scoring matrix. Um, but really that's where the blueprint comes in. But again, study sessions, you know, find other candidates. Uh, I don't know if we have a, a slide on the Slack channel. There was a Slack channel um, that was being run for a bunch of years where people can look for panelists um, as well and set up study sessions, but review your documentation and everything. Um, the mock defenses, I, I wanted to spend a moment on this. This will help you again, especially if you're not, uh, if your role currently isn't, um, if your role currently isn't customer facing or where you don't find yourself in front of customers doing these kinds of design workshops and so forth. The mock defense can be really helpful. Um, the most important thing is try to make it as realistic as possible. Um, have three people act as panelists. Um, if you find people who are just going to drill you over and over again on like every technical detail of everything, that's maybe not what you want. You want people who are going to ask you to force critical thought, ask you open-ended questions, the why. Okay, we kind of talked about this, getting them to ask you the why. Why did you make this design decision? Why did you, you know, why did you do ESGs in this configuration versus uh, an active standby? Uh, tier zero. Why did you do, um, you know, power management in this configuration? What was the, the business requirement? Those kinds of questions. Um, there is a timer. Again, it's on the VCDX website. You can get the timer to actually keep yourself honest and get 75 minutes for the defense. So set it for 75 minutes and hold yourself to it to manage the clock. Um, have a whiteboard, you know, available to you if it's online. Um, Make sure you are comfortable uh, drawing things online in some form or another. I'll let Phoebe talk about that because she's the best there is around this. Um, her and Paul McSherry are just unreal when it comes to this, like digital whiteboarding. But whether you have like an iPad that you do digital whiteboarding on or you're crazy fast with uh, using um, PowerPoint, whatever it might be, get comfortable with it. Again, that. That soft skill, like especially because we still are in the pandemic and we're not yet doing um, in-person defenses yet, your design scenario, the second part of the day where you're gonna have to do some whiteboarding for the panelists, that's a skill that you probably have to work on um, leading up to your defense. So I, I don't know if we have a slide on that or not. Phoebe, we had talked about it um, at one point. But... Oh, I think it's in, we broke it out to the other sessions, I think. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So again, mock defenses, keep yourself honest, have three panelists, get them to ask you good questions to be able to show you can explain the why of what you did. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, I, I wrote the VCDX right workshop series. Yeah. So this is uh, this one that you're attending today, session one, just in program and process. Uh, and then the second session we'll have in, I believe in two months, is demonstrating the design experience. So the, a lot of the tips that essentially Chris and I've been giving is more of that um, in terms of how you go about the defense and the design scenario. Um, and same kind of similar one for session three, but focusing on your preparation. And I think we would do like a mock, kind of the mock design scenario part as well, Chris, on the session three. 
So just upcoming series, if you guys are interested. Um, there are different series as well for VCDX mentoring and deep dive series. You can look that up on VMware Customer Connect Learning Webinar Library. All the past sessions are also available on demand, so you can look at different topics. It's essentially VCDX is talking about different topics about like maybe risk mitigation or logical, what is a logical design versus conceptual or, you know, different questions that we commonly get um, as you're preparing for your VCDX. Um, I think this is a little out of date, so I'm going to skip. Yeah, there are different books here as well. Um, and of course, this recording and the slide will be sent out and shared so you guys can have this as a reference. And this is the book that um, Chris mentioned. That's so the one. you have this. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Simon, oh, <laughs> so Simon has a VCDX podcast. You guys can go listen as well. He interviews different VCDXs or even different candidates, kind of get their perspective and give you more insight as to, you know, how you can become a successful VCDX candidate. So next steps, again, read the blueprint. I had it printed out physically as well and I had a copy on my desk like Chris did. So definitely read it and print it out, whatever you need to do. Um, and then of course, find a mentor, get into a study group, mocks, mocks, mocks. As panelists, um, you, I can tell if somebody has done and prepared you know, for the interview or not. So definitely just as many mocks as you can um, to feel comfortable. Prepare your app application, prepare your deck. Again, run mock defenses is literally the best um, advice I can give anybody. So um, I think that's it. So we have about 40 minutes or so left of the session that we reserve for Q&A. So you can come off mute, ask any questions or just put them in chat as well. But we're here to have answer any question. So obviously Chris and I'm here, um, although I do have to jump in about five minutes for another meeting. I brought Asaf in here. He's also a VCDX, one of the most recent ones for DCV. He's happy to answer any questions. And Doug, who's been answering questions and suggesting also, he can answer questions as well. He's he's done some of these workshops before too um, in the Doug's past. Doug's number so. 19, so he's been around for quite a while. Yeah, I didn't know what number he was. I'm like, I knew he was like in the in the tens and twenties. <laughs> so. Just looked it up for him. I just yeah. Think, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So we have some time. This is really for you. Um, the recording will become available. Uh, one of the reasons we do have you sign up for this beforehand is so that when the recording is available, it gets sent back out to you. Um, so uh, really, this is this is your time. So if you have some questions in the chat or unmute yourself and, and feel free to, to ask. So one thing I will just say, first of all, hi to everyone, but also as Phoebe mentioned, if anyone is interested in joining the VCDX Slack workspace, uh, it's a great resource. I'm gonna put my email in the chat, just send me an email and I will send you an invite. Um, it's it's a really great community. And we say that in some of the, the mentoring um, open office hours that we do that you don't have to be a VCDX to be part of the VCDX community. It's a journey, it's a process, and you can find help and help as well when you're um, going along that journey, when you're still a candidate and then continue helping people when you become a VCDX. So you'll find a lot of help there, both about the process, about you know, technical brainstorming, some things that Phoebe mentioned that mentors don't necessarily have the time uh, to answer every specific technical question that and discussion that comes out in um, for candidates. This is something that you can leverage uh, the rest of the VCDX community there and really get some great feedback and great ideas. So I'll just put my email out there. Feel free to send me a request to join the Slack workspace. And if you don't have any questions or you want to just hit us up on um, Twitter or whatever it is, that's fine too. Um, you know, really, this isn't just, I mean, we're available to answer questions really anytime. So the hashtag VCDX on Twitter is, yeah, there's Phoebe's, uh, she's highlighting it for you. See how quick she does that in PowerPoint? Um, so yeah, so, you know, uh, on, uh, on Twitter, 
Carl just posted vcdx at vmware.com. You can always ask the program questions as well. Uh, that will get to the people who run it behind the scenes for us. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm just grateful that everybody was able to join this morning. So, okay. So James has a question. What are the certification requirements for VCDX application? Is current considered 2022 versions, meaning that you have to run the entire gauntlet in a year? So I will defer to Carl. I will say, no, you don't have to do it all in a year. Um, the VCP is good for a certain period of time. And then that lets you start taking the VCAPs within, I think it's a two year window, but Carl, That's maybe you want to talk about that. It is. Later. That's yeah, that's right. It really is the VCIX version that we look at. Um, so if your VCP is a little bit older, but you're, you know, you get through VCIX, that's okay. Uh, the VCIX within the two years, it does um, on the um, website, when you do go to it and look at the path, if you don't have an, a VCDX certification, it does have the 2022 version. Um, and that's for those new candidates that we help guide them if they were to begin from the beginning. That's why it says that because you can't earn a 2021 today, right? It has to be 2022. So it's not, it's kind of a little weird that way because we, you know, we can't show to earn something that you can't earn. But if you've already earned it, will take up to two years. Hopefully that makes sense. But but yeah, so you do have a couple of years even after you've earned your VCIX, which is what we look at for version. Yeah. So in, yeah, so there you go. Carl, does the VC does taking the VCAP still refresh your your date? It does. Your VCs? It does, right? It does. Yeah. One. Yeah. So if you have a VCIX and you need to update it, you're not quite ready to apply. If you take one or the other VCAP, design or deploy, it will upgrade the VCIX version. Yeah. So you have a little bit of a window there and you don't have to don't certainly don't have to do it all in a year. Um, so yep. All right. James is right. <laughs> I don't see any other questions. Um, so you guys have all our contact information. So I think we can uh, close the session here. But Thanks everybody for attending um, and let us know. Just reach out anytime if you guys have any questions. Us off yeah, as well. Cool. Thank you everybody for being here. Phoebe, thank you. It was great seeing you again. Yeah, of course. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Phoebe, so much. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks off, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.